President Trump is still liable for everything he did while he was in office as an ordinary citizen. Unless the statute of limitations is run, still liable for everything he did while he was in office. Didn't get away with anything yet. Welcome to episode 89 of the Middle Unplugged, a break in the middle of the week when we take a step away from the far left and the far right. We take a look at some of the news of the day with a little more quiet, still contemplation. You know, I was always one of these people, and you've heard me talk about this before, that fell into the camp that, you know, the system held, that we had extreme norm breaking, we had literal violence, we had a literal insurrection, we had the worst extreme that could confront our country, and the system held. The courts proceeded to arrest people and put them in prison for their activities on January 6th. The president suffered uh, a, a political comeuppance and his approval ratings dropped, and he himself was going to be held accountable. The Electoral College votes were counted, and we all went along our merry way. Well, not so merry, but at least the system seemed to have held in the case of Donald Trump versus the United States. At least that was the supposition until we actually reached Donald Trump versus the United States or the United States versus Donald Trump. And I guess that what we learned here in this kind of, I guess irony is not really the word, this oddly coincidental gift that the, the Supreme Court gave us in honor of July 4th, they gave us this decision on executive power that you've now heard a great deal sp spoken about. Um, but I want to give you my thoughts on how I think this thing, first of all, I'm surprised by it. I'm surprised for a couple of reasons. One, that even, even phonies like this uh, Supreme Court that have talked about judicial restraint, that have talked about the rule of precedent and things like that, even they would have a difficult time inserting an entirely new constitutional construct um, that completely blows away what the literal founding fathers talked about in the construction of our system of government. You know, there had been a lot of conversation in the Federalist Papers about this very situation. This whole idea that the Supreme Court is trying to make us buy into now that, well, we've got this conflict of powers that the Supreme Court had to come in and resolve, um, that we deal with big questions for all presidents, and that it is simply um, we had to do or we're doing our job. And we hear some on the right who support this decision and support Donald Trump say that. But it was the literal discussion of the Federalist Papers. You know, I... There are several that you can point to, but Federalist 77 has is this conversation by Alexander Hamilton about, this is from 1788, before the Constitution was written and ratified, about what do we do about this fundamental question about uh, having a president that would be too powerful? What would constrain him in our system of government? And so here's what was written. From the election of the president once in four years by persons immediately chosen by the people for that purpose. And from this being at all times liable to impeachment, comma, trial, comma, dismission from office, incapacity to serve another, and to forfeiture and life in a state by subsequent pro uh, prosecution in the common course of law. That's just a paragraph talking about, well, why the system that they created would work. Um, and then comes the Supreme Court. And th frankly, there was another reason that I assumed that the Supreme Court would find it most advantageous not to act. Two reasons, really. One is there wasn't any real super important need for them to hop in. Yes, uh, President Trump was being prosecuted, and you can argue that it was timely, but the lower courts, in, in unanimous fashion, including Republican appoint, appointments, had laid out a pretty good argument for why, yeah, this is not that complicated, not that tough a case. They could have. They had a very easy opportunity to take a pass. And they even could have waited if they wanted to and not done anything until after the court trial had proceeded. But here it is. They jump in. They never miss an opportunity to disappoint me and everyone else. And they create what is really a pretty mind boggling. And I say mind boggling in that it kind of if you sat down with the exercise of trying to think about how you could really cause trouble with the new way that the Supreme Court has written this. 
um, you can come up with plenty, uh, plenty of ways. And it's important to keep in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind. We're not talking about, well, some hypothetical bad president who would hypothetically want to violate the laws or violate norms. We have one right in front of us. But before we go to the potential problems, let me give the decision its due by trying to explain as best I can, in as neutral a way as I can, what the Supreme Court decided in this case. Um, Okay. First of all, they take the type of conduct, and then they divide it into these two things, official conduct, and unofficial conduct. Uh, so if something is in official conduct, the first thing you've got to look at is it is it a conclusive and preclusive core constitutional authority, meaning almost literally is it in the Constitution? Um, uh, 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 if it is, pardons, treaty powers, commander in chief, the things that are right there in Article 2, um, you, you, well, if you're the president, if you're a listener who's the president, you have absolute immunity. You can't be examined. You can't be questioned. Um, and and not only that, the, any evidence can't be explored in pursuit of a question about that. Um, so uh, an example of that, the president of the United States putting pressure on the Justice Department to do an investigation or not do an investigation or prosecute someone or not prosecute someone for whatever corrupt reason, not even something that can be examined. So the other part goes to this kind of notion that they lay out of presumptive immunity, meaning we think you're immune, but we're open to the idea that you can show a, you can show us otherwise. And, and those are the things that are not specifically in Article 2, not specifically written, but are in the day-to-day work of the President of the United States. For example, hiring and firing executive branch officers. Um, And you can only look at that, you can only prosecute that if you can show that it doesn't pose any danger or intrusion on the authority and the functions of the executive branch. Does that sound um, overly broad and subject to a lot of interpretation? Basically, it's going to allow whatever court to pick and choose what they want to hold the president accountable for or not, because that language does not give you very much. Let's assume for a moment you say, no, it doesn't intrude on them then you can go ahead, you can prosecute, and you can gather evidence for the prosecution. What may fall into that category if pressuring the president of the United States to do something illegal. That may fall into that category, but basically everything else doesn't. So that's the official conduct stuff. You know, to say that it's not a a blanket uh, immunity, it's pretty close. It's a very big cover. Um, so now let's go to the unofficial conduct. And that is conduct that has nothing to do with his job, nothing to do with the Constitution, nothing to do with what he should be doing. He's just going off and doing something. Let's say a hotel deal. You can prosecute that um, if you can ascertain that it's an unofficial, that it's an unofficial conduct. It's interestingly in the Chutkin case, in January 6th case, there are some things that the president lawyer stipulate to were not official conduct. They'll never do that again in the future, and they may try to dial it back, but that wasn't there. Um, So maybe the false selector scheme, state courts, state secretaries of state, state countings, what does that have to do with you being president? Now, if I'm his lawyers, if I'm President Trump's lawyers, I say federal election, it's a federal function. And who knows if a court will just say, yep, that's right. Um, And maybe inciting people to riot. The stuff about being on the the speech in the ellipse. Now, I should say in the decision, it does talk about the idea how they see that virtually all presidential speech is in some way or another part of his official job. So I'm not even sure that that one sticks. So then we get so that's the neutral reading of the thing of what their decision held. Then you get into and you've probably seen some of this around the last couple of days since this decision's come out. You get into the hypotheticals that make the thing seem it, it seem crazy. Um, for for example, you know, you, when you start with this absolute powers thing, the core constitutional powers. Well, one of them is, um, and these are the things that can't even be reviewed, not by the courts, not by Congress. I want to point out also by my reading of this, 
For one thing, it's the militia. As the commander in chief, he's in charge of all the state militias, theoretically. Um, so if he goes and violates a law, for example, around immigration, um, he technically can, can do that. And even if he can't, or even if he decides he doesn't want to do it, he wants to deputize someone else to do it. You've got another core constitutional principle, which is the pardon power. The pardon power, the idea of investigating anyone in the future for selling pardons or corrupt pardons um, is gone, out the window. And think about the knock-on effects of all of that. Suddenly, everyone else can be a lawbreaker on his behalf because all he has to do is wave the pardon pen and suddenly an illegal act by someone else becomes an unquestioned uh, uh, um, uh, 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 right of the president under this under this decision. Um, I mean, he can fire he, all the stuff about civil service and Schedule F. The way I read this, he can violate the law and go and throw out um, and fire anybody he wants because that's seen, that's not a core one, but that is a, um, uh, uh, a responsibility of the executive is to name executive branch employees. Um, then there are the things that are other like, like non-core powers. Um, what if he orders the, the Department of Justice to order someone to investigate Anthony Weiner or order someone to prosecute Liz Cheney? Um, that's not a core function, but it is clearly an executive function. And according to this, you can't look at it if it does anything to limit his right to do it. So um, this is where like, can he order his vice president to do something illegal? It's not It's not really clear. Uh, then you've got to go to some of the really preposterous kind of things that seem preposterous, except in the context of who we're talking about here. So you've all heard this hypothetical about the president using his core constitutional authority to order, as, as its commander in chief, to order a member of SEAL Team 6 to kill a political rival. Um, you might think that with all of the discussion about that, there would be uh, a, clear, a clear rebuttal of that in this decision. It's not. In fact, the way I read it, um, and again, again, let me just stipulate something I should have stipulated at the top. I've said it a few times on this microphone. I'm not a lawyer, but frankly, I don't think these are issues that you should have to be a lawyer to figure out. This is the Constitution, our foundational document. And I, I was in Congress and I kind of read the Constitution a few times. But anyway, this notion of a, a member of the military, order a member of the military to, to kill one of your um to kill one of your opponents is basically permitted under this construct. Uh, and 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 uh, um, Justice Brown makes this interesting point. It's in a footnote. Um, I, I'm going to read all of it just because it's that good. To fully appreciate the oddity of making the criminal immunity determination turn on the character of the president's responsibilities, meaning do you have immunity because what are his responsibilities? Consider what the majority says, this is her dissent, is one of the president's conclusive and preclusive prerogatives, and this is a quote now, the president's power to remove those who wield executive power on his behalf. That's from the Constitution. While the president may have the authority to decide to remove an attorney general, for example, the question here is whether the president has the option to remove the attorney general by, say, poisoning him to death. Put another way, the issue here is not whether the president has exclusive removal power, but whether a generally applicable criminal law prohibiting murder can restrict how the president exercises that authority. She makes that hypothetical to say, look, <clears throat> I can't say it better than her. I don't know why I'm even trying. But to say basically, look, if you have the if, if we're only going to consider is this part of your, con your constitutional job and not how you do it, then we're opening it up to all these um, to all these things. And one other thing. If you have heard some suggest, well, this is not about the Trump case. This is about future presidents, blah, 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 blah. And we need to have a muscular and flexible judiciary that is able to move at a moment's notice, et cetera. Um, well, I want to point out that something that a lot of people have pointed out 
Uh, they say testimony and private records of the president or his advisors probing such conduct may not be admitted as evidence at trial. And that goes for anything that is in the category of um, of uh, the immune, the, 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 anything that is a part of his official duties. So what does that mean? That means you can't even look to see if it was. You can't even, and that is a, clearly to say, you got to throw out all this evidence against Donald Trump where he's, that was collected by Congress, collected by the January 6th committee, whatever it is when it comes to trial. And that brings me back to the, to, to this final kind of, well, let me make two points. First, let me say that, that to, to have this conversation about the balance of powers, the need for a muscular judiciary, and the need for a judiciary to be able, the, uh, for the executive branch to be able to move without fear, ba 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 ba. And not keep in mind that you're talking about literally a guy who has shown that the norms don't matter. That, you know, people, I've heard some people say, and even the court, I think, said this in its statement. It said, listen, you guys are getting all carried away about how bad this is going to be. This was Roberts responding to the dissents. Presidents are not going to do these things because fundamentally people get elected, people who are elected who are decent people that don't do sh stuff like this. This is Donald Trump we're talking about. Think about the period between his election, um, uh, uh, about uh, a period between his, his uh, think about the act. Okay, here's a better thought experiment. Think about if he had these rights and they had been enshrined like this. Think about how unhinged he would have been between the election and um, and January 6th or January 20th. Think about the crazy things he would have done. or Because frankly, his advisors can say, boss, you're totally allowed to send the military in to seize those ballot boxes. I mean, now it's it's reported he didn't do it because he was persuaded stuff that he couldn't do it. He didn't have the power to do it. It's hard to see what he doesn't have the power to do here. All right. So is there a tiny, tiny sliver of a silver lining? Well, it comes down to this distinction between official and unofficial conduct. In theoretically now, the January 6th, the January 6th case, this Tanya Chutkin, I should point out that by my reading, the Mar-a-Lago case still survives in hold because it was that case is not about what he did when he was president taking the documents it's not returning them and it's obstructing justice to prevent from returning them so i think the maralago case survives although who the heck even knows but in the chutkin case now she's going to have to have to go ev piece of evidence by piece of evidence in the indictment and try to determine whether it was official or unofficial what's the silver the tiny shred of a silver lining to that? Well, they're going to have to have hearings. They're going to have to have testimony. They're going to have to review all of the crazy stuff that is in that indictment that hopefully will lay out a narrative. Can Chuck can essentially have a trial about the evidence that turns into a trial about Donald Trump, at least in the public eye? Um, that's the hope. That's the narrow sliver of a hope that exists around this case. Um, today. The, you know, the week of July 4th, uh, for us to have this type of poking in the eye of the founding fathers, um, is it a real surprise? Well, for someone like me, who has been in the system held uh, camp, I am not 100% sure if changing the rules that made sure that the system held is really um, is really a great thing to celebrate here on July 4th. And we'll be right back with Ask Anthony Anything. So welcome back to Ask Anthony Anything. You heard me do a good deal on my show if you tuned in or got the podcast on the middle um, about the debate and the fallout from the debate and what I think is going to happen. I don't need to rehash it all here. Events are moving. I don't know. Are they moving very quickly? Basically, what it come down to is that the conversation I thought was fairly academic in that we always like the guy who's not on the field there's all kinds of practical reasons why Joe Biden will remain the candidate and why Donald Trump will remain the candidate. As we sit here, the polls are showing that indeed it hurt Joe Biden, but you can find a few that said it didn't maim him, it didn't kill him. But it did, it, it does prompt a what now conversation one way or the other about President Biden. Um, and I came down to a place that um, Jake Tapper did also 
take a listen to a little bit of him interviewing uh, Senator Chris Coons of Connecticut this past Sunday. Uh, I, I think it is easy to settle this right now by President Biden going to the Brady Press Center, uh, the press file in, in the White House, and doing a, and doing a two-hour press conference. Uh, it, everybody would run, cover it live. Uh, networks probably would cover it live. He'd be able to he'd answer all these questions. It's not a crazy thing to expect a president to do. And the fact is, you know that. The campaign knows that. The White House knows that. That's how you settle this. You just put him in front of reporters, and he handles himself with acuity, aplomb. We all see it was just a fluke. Oh, my God, I can't believe it happened. And we move on. The fact that you haven't done that says quite a bit to me. So I, maybe I should have cut it off a little bit. After Chris Coons basically agrees with the, the assessment, look, there's really only two ways to look at this. I understand that the president's going to be sitting down with a one-on-one -on -one interview with somebody, I think George Stephanopoulos. But there's a couple of ways to look at this. You either are adopting the footing that the president is up to the job. And in that case, you send him out there, maybe even in the Rose Garden. You've heard me talk about this, that I want him outside. I want him having to yell, kind of what he did in North Carolina. I want him being out there for a couple of hours until everyone wilts and they say, well, look at this guy. Either he's up to that. In that case, you obviously put him in that position. Or he's not. And unfortunately, the, to me, it's such an obvious thing to do that by not doing it, you are basically stipulating to the idea um, of his opponents, which is he's not up to it. Um, now, like I said, I'm not sure it matters. I think he's going to be the nominee by hell or high water. Um, and I think that you've got to manage it somehow. And things, you know, we're in a weird time here that, you know, there's all this conversation. Well, Donald Trump is like Teflon. And nothing seems to stick to him. He's January 6th, the uh, Access Hollywood. Well, maybe it's both candidates are that way. Maybe we're so partisan at this point, everyone just returns to their corner. But I do think that Jake Tapper, is onto something. Now, far be it for me, to, I'm, I'm down on Jay Tapper. You heard me talk about this on Saturday. I don't know why you need moderators of debates if they are not even going to do a modest fact check. And I'm not saying everything. I know there are hundreds of, of mistakes and, and lies that Donald Trump tells. When someone says three times that democratic states allow you to kill a baby in the 10th month or whatever it is, you can stop and say, that's not true, Mr. President, can you, whatever it is, or something like that. Anyway, but in this case, I do happen to agree. It's not he, It's not a unique position that Jake Tapper is taking. It's one that we have, uh, that that a lot of people are talking about, and I certainly believe. If he's up to it, and that's the, that's the party line by the White House, and all of these stories about his diminished capacities are um, untrue, then that's how you do it. You put him out there, hammer away, hammer away, have him basically um, show his medal. Um, so that's what we that's what we have today. It's kind of a rough, rough time if you're on uh, if you're on the team that I associate with, and you know, caring about the Constitution, caring about the future of the country, uh, wanting to have trials because I believe that that's the way you get to the truth of things. So um, it's been a rough. 4th of July week. I hope you have a pleasant one. If you missed any part of the show on Saturday, you can go get that as a podcast called The Middle. Uh, if you like anything you've heard here, you wanna, the best thing you can do is share it. Um, I really do appreciate all the support you've given me. Wiener, W-A-B-C at gmail.com is how you reach out to me directly. And this marks the end of The Middle Unplugged. <laughs>